Good evening, everyone. My name is Amanda Thomas, and I would love to welcome you to Science on Tap Online. Tonight, we are talking about I'm on the front lines of COVID-19, Ask Me Anything, part two. And uh, we did part one of this talk back in the end of August, and it went really well. And a lot of people were interested in doing another version of this or another round. So we are back with our two experts. We have Dr. Mayan Simkas, who is an epidemiologist uh, at the Washington State Department of Health. She's been on uh, in the COVID-19 incident management team since January in a range of roles uh, related to case and contact investigations. And she also oversees training for all case and contact investigators working with the Department of Health. And we also have Dr. Guy Shohat, who is a professor and emergency care physician at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, he, his areas of special interest include managing emergency conditions that affect the airways, and, uh, and his research includes gathering data on emergency intubation. He also manages the electronic health record for the UCSF emergency department. And if you have been to one of our events before, uh, you may know that we usually go about an hour. We've decided to go a little bit longer this evening, so we'll go to about 8.30. And I know that the presidential debate is going on right around now, um, but we, uh, we scheduled our event a long time ago, so we appreciate you all being here. Um, and I promise that we won't intentionally mute either one of our speakers' mics this evening, so you can count on that. And uh, let's see, let me fast forward, or fast forward, go to the next slide a little bit. Um, we are here at Science on Tap. If you are new to us, I want to give you just a little bit of information about us. We have been doing events here in the Portland, Oregon and Vancouver, Washington area for around seven years. And earlier this year, as so many other organizations did, we moved our events online. And we've been doing them mostly weekly, uh, mostly on Thursdays since then. And uh, tonight is actually our 31st event in 2020. So we've been doing this quite a lot. As I uh, mentioned, tonight is all Q&A. So you, I have some questions that were sent in by, uh, by some of our attendees in advance. So I will start off with those questions. But if you have questions that you would like to ask, you can do that. Um, if you're watching on Zoom, you can uh, put those questions in the Q&A tab. And we have folks, who, uh, our volunteers, who are going to be sending me those notes, um, those questions. And so if you see me, I'll be on screen the whole time. But if you see me looking off screen, that's because I am reading questions and, and preparing those. And um, if you are watching on Facebook, please go ahead and put those in the comments. And we, uh, again, we will have somebody who is sending that information over to me and I will get those questions, get to as many of them as we can. Also, we are recording this talk, hopefully. We were having some issues with the video before, so hopefully this is being recorded. And we, if you check out our YouTube channel, there are uh, recordings of all of our previous events, or most of them anyway, and our podcasts as well. So go check that out um, when we're done. And with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and welcome our speakers, our, our panel this evening, um, Dr. Shohat and, and Simkas. Welcome, Mayan and Guy. We're back. Hey. <laughs> and um, great. Thank you both for being here. Appreciate your, your time and expertise. And um, as we were talking about before, uh, there are probably going to be some similar questions to what we had in part one. And, but we're just gonna ask them again because things develop and, and science is, uh, is evolving. And um, there are also are und undoubtedly people who were not here for part one. And we wanna repeat those questions if, if that is something they're still interested in. So I am going to start with a question from Barbara. And she says, these, again, these are some of the questions that came in from uh, uh, email in advance. She says, at what stage in COVID-19 does a temperature usually happen? Is somebody pre-symptomatic and contagious before having a temperature? So that's a really great question. What we know about COVID-19 is that 
people's illness and people's infection can look really different. So first of all, we definitely have people who are totally asymptomatic throughout the duration of their infection. And those people are still contagious, just like people who have symptoms. Uh, for both of these, we use an estimation of either the start of symptom onset or the date that you got tested, if you're asymptomatic, you don't have symptoms, and we count back two days. So two days before either you were tested or your symptoms started is when we assume you are most contagious from then forward. Now, it's certainly possible somebody could transmit earlier than two days, but it is less likely. So we roughly use that two day window going forward through the duration of their isolation period. And isolation, remember, is what we use as guidance for people to stay home, stay healthy, and not infect others. And that is generally going to be calculated. It's the same way across all states, but it's calculated as uh, two sort of factors. The first is it has to be at least 10 days since your symptoms started, or if you're asymptomatic, at least 10 days since you were tested. Uh, and that is when your sample was taken, not when you got the results. And then the second rule to follow is you need to wait an additional 24 hours after your fever goes away, if you had a fever uh, and other symptoms are really resolving. Now, not everyone gets a fever. So when it starts, it can vary. Some folks, it's the first symptom. Other folks, it doesn't come at all or it comes much later. Some folks are having high fevers and some are having more mild fevers. So the presentation of this disease uh, is, is kind of unique. It's really vague and looks like a lot of other things and it can look really different in different people. So it's kind of a longer answer to a relatively clear cut question, but hopefully that gives you some more clarity. Yeah. I don't have anything you wanna to add to that? Only that if you are confused, don't worry, we are too. This has been one of the most clinically confusing things in my 25 years of practice. It's just really, really sick people have no fever at all. Some people have a fever and aren't very sick. Some people have really bad oxygenation and their x-ray doesn't look that bad. Some x-rays look horrible and the patient looks great. And then really weird things happen like funny toe findings or crazy rashes or clots in the most crazy places. So it's, this is turning into one of those just deep layered medical mysteries. And we're, I think we're, we're getting on top of the basics of how to do it. And that's partly why uh, people are doing much better with COVID now, but the weird non-basics just continue to surprise us. Yeah, it, it does sound very confusing. So um, I'm glad to know I'm not the only one, but th that's not right. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I am actually going to ask just briefly, Guy and Mayan, um, I know you both have a second computer going. If you can make sure that your microphones are off on that, because I'm hearing a little bit of feedback. So, but now I'm going to start with or uh, continue with the next, next. question. Um, this is from Richard, and it is, he asks, what sort of data do we have thus far, or what sort of data do we still need to reach consensus conclusions around certain COVID issues, such as contact transmission, indoor spatial distance for reasonable confidence that transmission is unlikely, et cetera? So Amanda and I kind of chatted about this beforehand. I'm going to give you my one-liner answer, and then I'm very curious what Guy has to say, too. My one-liner is... We've reached consensus on these issues if you believe in science. Um, there are a couple of moments, uh, a couple of features where we might need more information to clearly tease out some of the nuances, but the gist of the information that we have is, is quite clear. I think like with most things, science evolves and medicine evolves and they teach you day one of med school that you know, in 10 years, 40% of what you learned today will have been proven wrong and corrected, but it's often evolves. It, it's rarely a full turnaround, but I think that scientists generally have consensus on mask, what basics of mask wearing indoors versus outdoors, what type, you know, roughly what type of masks to use as my, I just laid out beautifully when you're infectious, it's confusing, but we generally agree on it. 
Guy, I have a question for you, actually. Yes. I'm sneaking in my own question, sorry. Yes, yes. So one of the things that we get asked about quite a lot uh, by friends, families, if you're an epidemiologist, is, is to talk more about airborne transmission and some of the more recent literature that's starting to point towards airborne uh, droplets rather than rather than the larger droplets that are transmitted, like when somebody is right next to you and you spit in their face. And I know you talked a little bit about this last time, but I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on some of the newer information that's come out from CDC or any of the other literature. I, I still haven't seen anything that, uh, that completely changed. So we, we, should I should I go back to the beginning of what of what we reiterate what we did on the first show? Sure. So we, yeah, we just we talked a little bit about there's some there's some semantic confusion between what we mean when we say airborne and what other people mean when they say airborne. So doctors and scientists when they say airborne are specifically referring to things that can just literally travel through the air, like tuberculosis which require us to do a very different type of treatment, wear very different types of masks, isolate the patients in different ways. In general, uh, this virus does not behave that way, except in situations where we cause it to behave that way by doing things like intubating you or giving you an asthma nebulizer treatment where we now aerosolize it into the air. But doctors, unfortunately, were going, well, it's not airborne, it's not airborne, it's not airborne, but it is transmitted through the air and people were left very confused. And the, the point being that you are constantly spraying these micro droplets when you talk, when you eat profoundly, when you sneeze uh, into the air. So very much the virus is very much transmitted through the air, um, but mostly in, in the form of these little respiratory droplets. And this is where masks without having even the full seal of an N95 mask, which was what you need to prevent say tuberculosis, where simple masks really work. There seems to be some question of whether there are situations or whether to small amounts the virus actually is truly airborne. Um, the UCSF line is, even if there are cases where it is airborne, the clinical, uh, the, the clinical landscape just doesn't jibe with that. We're just not seeing the kind of spread we would see like we do with measles, like you'd see with tuberculosis if the virus was primarily airborne. It generally spreads in a pattern that's most consistent with respiratory droplets, and then to a lesser extent with when you get these respiratory droplets on your hand or you sneeze on a table, someone touches that and then touches their mouth. So there is some sort of direct contact, but the majority of it is through respiratory droplets. Passing through the air, but in a more direct, short distance manner, and this is why being outside or wearing a mask are so effective because they control respiratory droplets with a mask, or when you're outside, it dissipates very rapidly. The respiratory droplets either fall to the ground or just dissipate. Does that answer? I mean, were you asking about a specific? Yeah. No, I'm, you nailed it. I was just curious yeah. if that new literature was changing your mind about it, but it sounds like- No, it, it, it doesn't fit with the, it just doesn't fit with the patterns of what we're seeing. We would be yeah. seeing a lot more rest healthcare providers being sick if that was the case. That's a good point. Related to your answer, uh, Chris asks a question about masks and it, it, are masks with filters needed or how about the, if they're homemade and you know sewn at home, does it matter? Um, also, Chris says, if I have a Monday through Sunday mask set up, so I only use one the same day each week, will any vi virus be caught in the filter, um, be dead within that week? Is there a timeline for reuse? I usually am only out for an hour or two on any given day. Thoughts about masks? Sure, shall I? Um, go ahead. So uh, let's go backwards from the beginning about the reuse of masks. Uh, thank goodness we actually have enough PPE now, at least most of the types we need, um, but we were actually doing quite a bit of mask reuse um, we're certainly still wearing a mask all day. We're not changing it with every patient like we used to. Um, the Pre-COVID, when we wore a mask, we would change every patient. Um, but when we were recycling N95 masks, so our approach was uh, that we considered 72 hours sufficient for uh, when you put away a mask, we would have three, each would be assigned three masks and we would recycle them every, every three days. And we would store them though in a paper bag, not a plastic bag, because you don't want to 
to store a mask in a moist environment, because then if there's any sort of respiratory droplets caught on there, then you're just sealing them in a bag and the virus can probably last a lot longer. But in a dry environment, like a paper bag, the virus desiccates, it dries out quite easily um, in, in a dry environment and dies. And is, uh, you're generally considered okay. We also were people trying various things with baking masks and re, re, uh, uh, various uh, heating techniques. Um, but honestly, what we were doing in the ED for the first four months of COVID was just putting our masks in a paper bag um, and ro rotating them every three days. Uh, types of masks. Um, homemade is okay. It's certainly good. Um, two layers, much better than one. Um, one good test is hold it up to the light. If you can see through it, then respiratory droplets can probably get through it. Um, this is sort of, there was a lot back and forth uh, about the, uh, the buffs using these sort of athletic, uh, uh, I don't know how to describe them, sort of scarf type thing that wraps around your head, which is really cool because you just pull it up. You could exercise and pull it up really easily. And there was one study that wasn't even meant to study masks. It was meant to study the technique for measuring masks that showed that there was possibly these buffs made it actually worse, not better, because they were acting like a, 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 like a fine screen, like putting your, almost your finger on a hose end, that maybe they were actually making your, your, um, your respiratory droplets finer and shoot out further. Um, that hasn't really been proven either way yet, but our general feeling is if you're using a homemade mask that has two layers of even cotton, that seems to be a whole lot better than none. Um, uh, bandanas also in that one study that was far from perfect or far from even good. Ban bandanas and those buffs did not do very well. Bandanas better than those buffs, but almost every other mask did quite well um, with surgical masks doing far, far better. Um, if you can get your hands on surgical masks, we'll be used at the hospital, those are really cool. Um, they're quite easy to breathe through, but they have, um, they actually have an electrostatic charge uh, within that little paper mesh there. So not is it only a dual layer of paper mesh, but it actually has a little electro electrostatic charge meant to capture little respiratory droplets. That's what we've been using in the OR for years and they're surprisingly comfortable. Um, then we get into vented masks. So N95 masks are these very different masks. They're masks that we use uh, in cases where we were concerned about airborne uh, um, pathogens. So in the past, TB was the normal time that I would use an N95. These are pretty thick. They're hard to breathe through and they're very tight. You have to get fitted for them. Um, part of the fit test is not being able to smell a pretty noxious uh, smell. And they test you and they make you move your head around. And you wear an N95 for eight hours and you generally have a bruise across here and it's pretty uncomfortable. It's hard to breathe through. Um, when people use N95s in non-medical situations, say uh, dust or the fires, these were quite popular in the fire in California fires a few years ago, they put a little vent right here. So it's, so when you breathe in, the vent closes, so nothing gets in, but when you breathe out, the vent opens up, which is really nice because it, that way glasses don't fog, you're not having that kind of claustrophobic feeling of rebreathing some of your CO2. The problem is if you're trying to prevent, so wearing an N95 in a, COVID environment is this sort of odd thing of you're very protected, but you're emitting your respiratory droplets openly through this valve. It's a little bit of a, oh, uh, F you to everyone around you potentially. Um, I have told older patients who needed to be in an environment where they were really afraid, but they had trouble, they had some respiratory difficulties, maybe this is an option for you. Um, we, if you come into our hospital with, an, with one of these vented masks, we make you put a surgical mask over it. Interestingly, in some of those studies where they actually looked at uh, airflow dynamics, it wasn't as bad as we thought with those masks, which is funny because most other studies we've looked at, like with those intubation boxes, when you put a small hole in something, it's actually a very bad idea. It actually shoots things out much further, back to that analogy of putting your finger on the end of the garden hose. Um, but weirdly, these masks seem to do okay, but the party line is these aren't, they're kind of, they're not great. They don't. They protect you, but they don't protect other people. And socially, there's a very intense thing to do because it's basically saying to the people around you, "I care about me and not about you." And it's a shame because I think a lot of the people buy these masks thinking 
I bought the most protective thing for everyone around me. And in essence, they're actually not. So it's, it's hard. The theme is it's complicated. Mayan, anything you want to add to the, the mask conversation? The only piece I'll highlight is guys talking about that, that social discomfort and some of the stigma that we're dealing with uh, all throughout this pandemic that, that can look a lot of different ways. There's stigma about staying home. If stay home, there's stigma about people being too safe or not safe enough, or making choices that are uh, unjust for other people, whatever it might be, there is so much stigma associated with everything in this pandemic. And it's just good to be aware of it and, and kind of be conscious about the judgments that we make around other people's choices. Because sometimes you just, you encounter somebody and you're really frustrated and they just may not know any better. They may truly be thinking, as Guy said, that they're making the best choice. Yeah. Can I, can I even say one more thing about this? Because it's interesting. Atul Gawande wrote about this early on in The New Yorker. It was really prescient. It was really ahead of his time. He said, we need to rethink the culture around going to work sick and around mask wearing. Um, we need to start with medicine and then bring that to the rest of the culture so that we, we have such a long culture in medicine of you're sick, you go in unless you're dying. You don't, you don't make a colleague work for you. We need to change that. We need to make it okay to not come to work if you have a cough or a fever and get a test. But also he noticed, he said, I'm a surgeon. I wear a mask for a living. In the OR, if anybody drops, drops sterile uh, technique, you immediately call them out on it. You ask them to change their, to go change their gloves, wash it, uh, re-scrub and put their, you know, get, get sterile again, put new sterile gloves on. You would never reach, pull down your mask in the OR because you wanted to be more clear when you said something. And yet, he said, I see surgeons outside the OR doing this all the time, and we don't call each other on it. And we need to get more comfortable saying to our colleagues, hey, you just sort of pulled your mask down to talk to me in the cafeteria. That's, that's not, and we need to say it in a very non-judgmental supportive way. And so then the rest of society can do it too. And boy, he was right, and we're still not getting that. Mm -hmm. So be, be, be sweet and gentle to each other and kind, but in a parental way, you know, Got to call them out on it. It's not okay to do this. I'm going to pivot just a little bit. Um, Lynn asks, uh, what exactly are, quote, underlying conditions, uh, end quote. And we, you are based in California and you are based in, in Washington, so you probably don't receive the uh, daily updates from the Oregon Health Authority, but they, they report on the, the deaths that have happened and they say this person had underlying conditions. What, do, what does that mean? This is so charged and I'm, you know, underlying conditions is a phrase to describe any number of diagnoses that somebody might have prior to being infected and diagnosed with COVID. And it could be anything from COPD or lung disease, or it could be heart disease, or it could be asthma, or it could be, um, it could be mental health diagnoses, it could be an eating disorder, it could be any number of things. And the reason I said it's charged is because identifying which of those underlying conditions are actually relevant to the discussion. In my mind, it's an equity concern. I think that we immediately jump to conclusions sometimes about conditions that are not actually conditions. I'm thinking particularly around the lines of fat phobia and sizeism and weightism, which are uh, tremendous issues within the world of public health and a totally separate talk we can do another time. But the point is, these are often highlighted as underlying conditions, when in reality, a lot of what we are seeing when we see certain populations more affected by COVID and any illness than others are structural inequities or structural health access problems that are driven by societal injustices far more than an underlying health condition that has a biologically plausible explanation for making somebody more sick or more likely to be sick. So 
it's sort of a mixed bag and we're still kind of figuring out what some of the risk factors are for, for severe illness and for becoming ill. And it's the same for any other condition that we talk about. When we talk about influenza, there are certain conditions that might make you more likely to have severe illness. Same thing for uh, pregnancy. There are certain conditions that might lead to a higher risk pregnancy. So underlying conditions is not going to be unanimously the same universal across the board of all primary focused conditions here, but it, it's a conversation that I think we need to have a more, more intentional discussion around in, in the public health world and in medicine. Guy, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll look at the other side of it of the the, so, so of the sort of physical, I, I, and I couldn't agree more that the, the social determinants of health has matters here as much as with any disease. And we see it again and again that the people who are suffering more are often those in uh, living conditions that allow spread of the disease and have poor access to healthcare and poor access to health information. But there are definitely some physical things and health things that make you both more prone to getting sit, uh, ill and doing more poorly when you get it. Uh, this is an interesting one because age is really the big one here. Uh, this is a weird virus and you can get sick with this as a, when you're younger, but generally you don't. Um, and it's basically as you get older, the virus gets much more likely to kill you. To the, you know, once you, the, the rough, the early numbers were sort of one and a half percent in your, early 50s and something that would be a big jump in your 60s and a bigger jump in your 70s where people over 75 are looking at uh, mortality rates in the teens. Mm -hmm. um, being overweight is a problem. Having pre-existing lung disease is a big problem. Um, although sometimes clinically not as big as we thought. Um, being immune compromised is a problem, particularly our lung transplant patients have issues because now they have lung disease and uh, immune compromise, um, but by far age is the big is the big one. Um, and, but that said, we've we've had to have some of the ICU doctors sort of talk us down and saying, "Hey, we are regularly still extubating elderly patients with COVID. They have long, rocky courses, like they do with most other diseases, but don't feel like." oh my goodness, I send an elderly patient to the ICU, it's done, you know, this is done. It's just an inevitable slow death. This is not, not the case. And we've gotten, we've gotten a whole lot better treating this and a whole lot more comfortable treating it. We do it with confidence now. So Guy brings up an important point and there were two studies released very recently. Um, one of them was out this week or last week that looked at the mortality rate among hospitalized COVID patients over time. And what we've seen is this dramatic drop in the mortality rate among hospitalized COVID patients. One study was in the US, one in the UK, uh, you know, tenfold, de not tenfold decrease, at least a, oh gosh, I don't want to tell you the wrong number. You can look it up. The point is we've seen this massive reduction and the way that these studies are conducted, if I put on my epidemiologist hat, I guess it was already on, is to control for those other factors. So we are saying, okay, let's just control for age, let's say age aside, race aside, ethnicity aside, um, all of these underlying factors aside, are people truly doing better when they're hospitalized now than they were say in March or April? And they are, which really does suggest that our terrific colleagues in the hospital settings are doing amazing work and really learning how to predict problems before they get worse, treat patients effectively, and that is, probably explaining why we're seeing this large reduction in mortality. On, on a corollary to that, we, we gained from the experience of our European colleagues and our Seattle colleagues. <laughs> um, but also, and this is sort of sad, we're gaining from the fact that <laughs> politically we haven't dealt with this well and thus we have an ongoing crisis. We didn't have this sharp spike and then drop that most of the rest of the developed world had. And so, <laughs> uh, 
we've gotten better at treating this and become maybe world experts in treating this because we did maybe such a bad job in preventing these cases in the first place. So we've been forced to communities across the country. And weirdly, we've been forced to become regional experts and experts in through uh, in unofficial networks because there's been such poor central uh, dissemination of data because once more due to political issues. So I'm, I'm going to jump in very lightly into the political realm a bit. We were talking about this in advance. Um, uh, Roberta asks, and I'm sure many of us have also have a similar question of, you know, how did Trump recover so quickly? I have a hard time believing he really had COVID-19. What do you have to say about that? All right, I'm going to set it up and then Guy's going to swing at it. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> All right. So, so let me set it up with it, right? <laughs> Here we go. So first of all, here's my concern. If the president truly had COVID-19, as we've been, um, uh, it's been indicated, then he actually didn't follow the right isolation guidance. So that means that he potentially exposed a whole lot of people in the days between when he found out about his positive test and when he truly started to isolate. So that's my first concern. There's quite a lot of, um, there's a lot of science that drives these decisions for why we set guidance for how long people are supposed to stay isolated. So remember, it's that 10 days plus 24 hours that we talked about earlier. So if somebody tests positive for COVID, like the president, we expect them to stay isolated for at least 10 days and 24 hours after that fever resolves. So did he actually have it or not? And Let's start by looking at some of the data and let's just think about it big picture. So first of all, we know that supplemental oxygen uh, doesn't really get given pro prophylactically. That's not really a standard procedure. And people aren't generally hospitalized unless they have great need for it. Now, once you're hospitalized, what do we know about the trajectory of COVID illness? If you are hospitalized with COVID, your likelihood of dying of COVID is so much higher than if you were not hospitalized. And it's not because of the hospitalization, right? If you are hospitalized, you're more likely to have severe illness. We also know that people who have severe illness and who are hospitalized have more sequelae. They have more long-term symptoms over time and they last and they are more severe for longer. And we have tremendous data that shows us this. So all people are different. We all have different immune systems. Our bodies are going to respond to illness very differently. Some people who uh, make their way through COVID end up with amputations. Others don't really have much of a problem. They're a little sniffly and they have a cough for a while, but they seem fine. That dramatic variability though is very much uh, in line with that severity, right? So you have severity where maybe you're leading towards long-term respiratory illness and fatigue, myalgia, whatever it might be, or very mild illness. And some of the patterns that we saw reported in the news suggest severe illness, but there are other practices that may suggest non-severe illness. So I think there's a discrepancy here. And with that, I'm gonna hand it to Guy. <laughs> so I think the caveat here is we were just not given a whole lot of information. Um, I mean, in keeping with, I think, the, the general nature of uh, the present White House, we're just not given a whole lot of information, we're giving very filtered information. And so it, it's hard for, uh, there, there's a whole little world out there of doctors trying to guess on what actually happened, but um, we don't fully know what we, I, I am guessing if he was regularly tested that he knew about the test long before we were made aware of the test because as Marianne stated earlier, the fever comes later in the disease, respiratory symptoms come later in the disease. Um, if they come early in the disease, you're probably pretty sick and you're gonna end up in the ICU. Um, so I think he'd been sick for a few days before this. It, it's very weird to get, when I heard announcement of test, then hospital, then oxygen, I was like, whoa, he's getting sick in a hurry. So who knows? Um, we never, it was very unclear what his chest x-ray showed. Uh, 
we, we didn't get a whole lot about when, when the negative, when did the test turn negative. Um, VIPs get very different treatment than the rest of us. And we all assume it's better care and it's not actually. There's a lot, dis there's not a lot written about this but there's a lot discussed about this. It's always interesting when doctors talk about this. VIPs tend to get a whole lot of cooks involved and tend to get a whole lot of care they don't need. They tend to get put in ICUs when they don't need it, get specialty consultations when they don't need it, get drugs way before they need them. In addition, they often get really smart people caring for them in teams and access to drugs they couldn't get otherwise. So sometimes they really get hurt by the care we do for them. Um, and presidential medicine has been described as a whole different ball game. Um, so Trump, did he go to hospital when he was supposed to or did he go there? Uh, sort of out of an abundance of caution. That's, I, I don't know. Yeah, I would expect he, he would only want to go to hospital if he was sick as can be, but I'm, I'm making guesses about what I feel his personality is, that he's a person who does not want to show weakness. Um, I was surprised when he went to the hospital and thought, whoa, he's really weak. Um, but let's talk about the drugs he got, because I think that there's a wild card in there that might've really changed the game. Um, it could have been that he just had a really mild case and they were building it up. It could have been that he had a really erratic, weird case where he got sick and then sort of got better. And that certainly happens. Um, or it could be that one of the drugs he got really changed the course of things. Um, that might be the fact. So he got look, the three main things that he got, uh, remdesivir, dexamethasone, and the new uh, Regen Cove 2 from Regeneron, the antibody mix. We're going to talk about that one last. So. Uh, Remdesivir, it's an uh, antiviral, not originally developed for, uh, for treating uh, COVID, but fell into sort of popularity as one of the many things. We basically tr immediately tried everything we'd ever knew that had worked against a virus before. Every antiviral, hydroxychloroquine, even though we think of it as an antimalarial, it has some an antiviral. And this was one of the few things that stuck in early trials. Um, you're only supposed to get that drug if you have pneumonia requiring oxygen. Did he have pneumonia? I don't know what his chest X-ray showed. Did he require oxygen? It seems like he maybe required oxygen for a short time. They wouldn't really talk about it. He didn't really seem to have the indication to get that drug. Um, is it a harmful drug? Probably not. Is it a helpful drug? Maybe not. <laughs> uh, there's some trials that show minor improvement, um, but there's this growing overall consensus that maybe it's a really expensive drug that maybe helps a little bit and probably is not a big game changer at treating COVID, that it probably gives you a little bit of help if you're hospitalized. Would I take this drug if I was hospitalized with COVID? Absolutely, I don't think there's a big downside. It's the standard of care. This drug is making a lot of money for its pharma pharmaceutical parent company right now. It's not a miracle drug, but it's probably somewhat helpful. It's not a bad idea. He got dexamethasone, which is a steroid. Interesting choice. So DEX normally is something, it, in many disease processes, what happens is it's not the disease that gets you in the end, it's your body's crazy overreaction of your immune system that gets you in the end. From meningitis, from sepsis, from various pneumonias, it's often your body's overreaction. Your immune system just goes into overdrive and causes all sorts of, this, this in the end causes a lot of the damage. And in many disease states, we will give steroids to reduce inflammation to reduce this maladaptive response. And sure enough, like with many things, it's shown that dexamethasone is helpful uh, with COVID infection if, especially for people who are intubated and need oxygen, and to a lesser extent for people who just need oxygen. Um, he needed oxygen for maybe a day, unclear. I don't know, I don't know what his, his requirements were. Not a typical, he, he got dexamethasone very early in the game. Uh, once more, we're back to VIP medicine. I'm sure his doctor, I can't picture any doctor who would not have given that to a president in that situation, honestly. But that doesn't mean it's good medicine. I um, mean, there was a lot of conjecture was his, his ebullient mood due to the dexamethasone. Could be, people get really intense mood changes and often get pretty giddy and manic with, with dex. Um, did that turn him around? No, in fact, giving dex early in the disease course is probably bad for you. At that point, it's probably suppressing your immune system and not really helping things. We feel that its real use is 
if you're having sort of overwhelming uh, lung dysfunction, immune system dysfunction, and we're trying to suppress that over response of the system. So it really helps in, when you're in the ICU sort of situation. And now the wild card. Uh, the, two, the drug that's a combination of two monoclonal antibodies against the spike pro, oh, and I, immunologists forgive me if I get this wrong, the spike protein of, of SARS-CoV-2, of the, of the virus that causes COVID-19. So monoclonal antibodies are really cool drugs. Um, these are drugs that are manufactured to produce an antibody specific to usually a, a region on whether it's a, a cancer or a, a pathogen like a virus and helps target it for your immune, either to shut it down or targets it for your immune system to then take out this, this element. This is a pretty cool drug because it uses two antibodies because viruses tend to mutate. And so it hits it from two approaches. So even if the virus mutates, you assume that one of the two antibodies will still stick to it. When I read about these, this drugs coming out months ago, I was like, whoa, this is where we're going. Um, it's interesting because these drugs are wildly expensive and an infusion only. And it was clear that these were never, that a vaccine was still gonna be the answer. These drugs are never gonna solve COVID, but they could definitely help really, really sick patients not, from not dying. Um, and a thought in the back of my mind, or really rich people who can get their hands on these drugs for infusions. Um, the only people getting this drug right now are getting it through trials, which is appropriate. That's the way it should happen. And Trump got this drug in, uh, in, a, in a, quite a high dose, actually. He did not get it as part of a trial. He got it in what is referred to commonly as compassionate use. And I think that one could fully expect that anybody on his level of importance is gonna get this in this situation. Any major world leader I think who got, who got uh, COVID now would probably find a way to get access. It's interesting that Trump golfs with the CEO of this company. So he had easier access perhaps, but I don't think Walter Reed would have had trouble getting a dose of this for him. Was that a medically good move? I would take it in his situation. Um, did that turn him around? I don't know, we don't know. This was a, this is what we call an anecdote, not proof. This is an N of one, this is one case. I mean, I think these are the, mo the most interesting drugs out there right now. And it very well could be that he was heading towards being really sick and this drug turned him around, um, which there's some profound irony there of uh, sort of real cutting edge science saving the person who is kind of a poo-pooer of science and an embracer of junk science and hydroxychloroquine. Um, there's another funny irony there too that he, the guy who's helped push this is a golfing buddy. I mean, that's just amazing to me, but this is the mystery. But since we don't actually know what his oxygen requirements are or any of that, I mean, all of this is a mystery. We have no idea what happened with Trump. Sorry. Cool to let's just talk about some of the drugs though. Definitely. I'm, I'm going to skip a couple of questions and then come back to them. But one of the most recent questions is from an anonymous attendee saying, uh, doing, whoops, let me get back to that screen. Uh, doing voter registration outreach, one of the things I keep hearing from Trump supporters is that COVID is overblown. 99% of people recover from it, et cetera. Is that stat accurate? What would you say to someone who comes at you with that as a way to dismiss COVID as being politicized and say that it's actual risk, uh, risk, sorry, my phone died. Um, actual risk, of course, 1% of the US population is 33 million people. So that seems like a lot of dead people, um, but doesn't seem to compute when people say 99% survival rate. Who wants to take this? That's you. <laughs> Is it, you know, I'm struggling because that, that particular statistic, you can, you can pull statistics from all over. And, and the truth is that we're still relatively early in understanding the trajectory of this virus in the United States. It hasn't even been a year since we've known of this virus on our planet. So we're still gathering more information about truly what is going to be the long-term patterns of mortality. Uh, and, and of long-term uh, illness. Now, survival or, or how long people are affected or if people are affected, I think a lot of that also has to do with what you consider surviving COVID. If having long-term symptoms 
is considered survival. Okay. But if having long-term symptoms means you are still truly suffering from having had this illness, then maybe you shouldn't be counted among those who are fully cleared of it yet, right? Those long-term effects are, are vast, they're varying. And I think that as a result, we have to be very cautious with how quickly we dismiss uh, the fact that so many people are becoming ill and they're not necessarily hospitalized. And that, frankly, we know that a large proportion of our population has been infected and we're not aware of it yet. And we're not going to be because of testing. In fact, there was a really interesting study out of LA County uh, in the past couple of weeks where they did a, a seroprevalence study. They took a whole bunch of people, random sample, and they checked to see if they had antibodies for COVID in their blood. And what they found was something like double or triple the proportion of the population having, having had uh, been infected with COVID in the past several months than they thought. I think they thought it was something like maybe 7% and it was something in the 20%. I'd so have to double check. But the point is COVID is far more widespread than we think it is in the population. And sure, what you're asking about that particular number is about mortality, but the actual effect of the virus on our population and our, on, on our society is massive, not just from the clinical outcomes, but because of how it is uh, it is amplifying and expanding the effects of our social determinants of health and inequities and in access to care, the way that it is influencing people economically and how that is then having subsequent effects on mental health and well-being, right? So the chain of events that is that is initiated by a single case of COVID in a family or by the massive spread of COVID within the population, it can be pretty profound. So I think it's all about how you define it. Uh, you know, we, we had a wonderful science on tap talk a few weeks ago where we heard about communicating with anti-vaxxers and how do we, how do we have those very challenging conversations with people who really don't want to listen and who believe truly that they are right, that they have the science behind them and that anything you say is purely wrong. And, you know, the message that I took away from it is sometimes those are conversations that aren't going to go the way you want. You're not always going to be able to change somebody's mind. Uh, and we don't really have the best techniques yet for figuring out how to communicate these sorts of messages. So if you're standing in front of a massive hoax believing person who really does not want to listen to you, you're not going to change their minds. Use that energy elsewhere. Use that energy to vote. There you go. Go vote. But also use that energy to educate those who are still trying to understand and actually want to have a conversation with you. So roundabout, roundabout response to that, but I don't think the st single statistics like that are particularly informative in the context of a very complicated pandemic. Yeah. Can I add to that? All of that plus, let's talk about that 1% number. If, if we accept the number is 1%, sure. Uh, that's 1% using the weight of our entire amazing technological system. That's using days of ICU care. That's using hospital systems. That's using multiple return visits to ERs. That's using home oxygen systems. That's using <sighs> amazing drugs we just discussed that have just been, that are just quickly being driven through the pipeline. That's you know, that, uh, that and completely ignoring all of the people who, when you talk about mortality, the 1% have died, that ignores all the people who had strokes and all these other side effects and maybe have some long, that, that ignores tremendous numbers of days lost of work of, uh, of, and maybe decreased lung function down the road for all these people. But even putting all that aside, what does it mean for 1% mortality? We've, this is how we get, we have people who are anti-vaccine vaccination now. People are no longer afraid of infectious disease. When we get a fever now, we get a cold, we just fully assume we're gonna get over this. What does that mean to, if you've got a fever or a cold and now get a one in a hundred chance of dying despite this whole medical industry that could put you in the ICU and get you all these questions? That's crazy, we don't want, you know? And this, and 
that's why we've had a few extra 300,000 deaths in our country this mm -hmm. year. And I, I think this is part of the problem with COVID. If it killed 20%, it would be easy. It would be easier. I guess everyone would stand up and understand, but when you have something that's just 1%, some people have a lot of no difficulty saying, okay, let's, let's shut down the economy. Let's protect us. Let's, let's prevent hundreds of thousands or even millions of people from dying. Other people are like, eh, you know, this is, this is America. We're willing to, this is, it's a little bit more of a Darwinian society. We're willing to call the herd. It's uh, to me, 1% is a big number. Can you imagine if you're, when your child has a fever, if 100 times that would lead to death? I mean, this was what, this was what life was like 100 years ago. Uh, we kind of don't want that anymore. I think it's pretty well known that humans are bad at assessing risk, um, truly understanding what is risky and what is not. And that leads me to my next question about air travel. Um, <laughs> Lisa and uh, a couple other folks, Liz, uh, Katharina, um, were asking about air travel and eye protection and you know is it safe is it not um, should we be using masks using eye protection face shields um, and uh, there was another question Linda asked about is a road trip a bad decision there's so much we could talk about there so I'm just gonna throw it out there and <laughs> see who wants to who wants to start go ahead guy I'll follow you no, no you have to start because I just talked so much <laughs> okay Okay, get yourself a glass of water. Um, okay, let me start with this. Last last time we had our, our last session, I think Guy and I responded to a similar question by saying what we would do. And so I'm gonna start with that. You could not pay me to get on an airplane right now. I'm gonna put it that way. Now, yes, I've heard from, from friends and colleagues who have flown and said that flights are empty, it's fine. You've got that little middle seat buffer. No one's sitting in the dreaded middle seat right now. You still couldn't pay me to do it. And yes, I know the air is circulating out of the planes and that's usually, uh, that's generally the practice. They're just upping how frequently they're doing it. But unfortunately, people aren't good at following rules. They don't like to listen. How many times, for those of you who are watching, uh, have you been on a plane and watched somebody just pull their mask down to pop a little snack in there and then pop it back up? Even if the airlines aren't providing snacks and beverage service, people are certainly going to the store and buying the snacks and bringing the M&Ms or the McDonald's or whatever and eating it on flights. People are gross when they eat. Things splatter everywhere. I don't like watching people eat. It's not fun. In fact, not being at restaurants, maybe it's a bit of a blessing for all of us because people are... <laughs> People are gross. Kids are really gross. People touch things and then they go to the bathroom on the little airplane and they turn the little knob and they go inside and they don't wash their hands and don't get me started about the water on airplanes and actually how the filtration systems work and how frequently or infrequently those are cleaned. Different story. So the point is, if you get on a plane, you are exposing yourself to additional risk. It is a calculated risk that you are taking. And if you choose to do that, if it is something that you need to do because of a family emergency or something else, there are certainly things you can do to protect yourself. So if I had to get on a plane, what would I do? I would, first of all, plan to have a plastic face shield that would cover my eyes because I don't know what people are doing. You know somebody's gonna pull their mask down because they have to sneeze and it's gonna get in your face. So put that mask or that face shield on. In fact, you can buy a pack of them at Costco. And I'm not getting paid to say that, but you certainly can. And they sit on your eyes kind of like eyeglasses and you can get them there. Then I would also be wearing a mask underneath it because wearing a face shield is not the same as wearing a mask from a scientific standpoint. But also if you live in a state where there is a mask mandate, a face shield is not a replacement for a mask. They are not the same thing. They have very different purposes. If you're in a clinical setting, if you work in uh, lumber, it doesn't matter. It's different purpose than wearing a mask itself. So I'll be wearing a mask underneath it. Uh, if I were fit tested, I might consider wearing an N95, but I don't think I would because having to go from the West Coast where I am back to the East Coast or the Midwest, for that long wearing an N95 really doesn't sound pleasant. So if I have the ability to wear a surgical mask or something similar, I might do that. 
or I might wear a cloth mask that actually covers. So one of the reasons people don't like wearing masks is because when you start breathing, it'll kind of flow into your mouth if you're wearing one that's not fitting you well. And I find for a fact that I, I struggle with cloth masks. When I breathe in, for whatever reason, the way my face is shaped, it kind of goes into my mouth and I don't like it. So I do better with more of the surgical style paper masks. That works for me. For other people, the cloth ones are great, but you need to make sure that they're actually fitting, actually covering your nose, not just resting on the tip of your nose, but covering your full nose, covering your mouth, making sure there's not big pockets on the side so there's air flowing through. So I'd be wearing a really good mask. I'd be wearing a face shield, which will cover my eyes. Would I be wearing gloves? No, <laughs> gloves aren't gonna help. You're not really getting COVID through your fingertips, but they are. You are getting it through your fingertips if you're taking your fingertips and touching your eyes. So if it helps you to wear gloves to remember not to touch your face, go ahead and do it. But for me, I'm not gonna wear gloves because that's not really protecting me. I'm just gonna wash my hands a lot, bring a whole bunch of extra hand sanitizer. And that's how I would handle a plane if I had to do it. Plus, I would make sure to quarantine for my full 14 days after I get off the flight before exposing other people. Then you mentioned road trips. So if I had to get across the country quickly, uh, you know, a road trip isn't necessarily the fastest option, but a road trip, if managed correctly, is your safest choice. So if I needed to get across the country, what would I do? I would rent an RV that has its own little chemical toilet. I would load up the coolers with food and I would only stop at gas stations where I would be in and out and I would quickly wash my hands. So that's how I would manage getting across the country. Why? I don't need to use public restrooms, which are certainly a concern if they're not being sanitized and cleaned regularly. I don't have to worry about more interactions with people in hotels. I don't have to worry about um, standing in front of the hotel desk. I did this early in the response and people all around you not wearing their masks and the hotel clerks not enforcing it. So it allows you to bring that safe space with you. So that would be my personal choice. I think there are other ways to go about a road trip that, that aren't um, super problematic. Hotels, for example, really aren't a high risk space if they're using correct cleaning practices, um, especially if you're just kind of quickly getting into the room and then leaving. We're not really worried so much about the fomite transmission, the, the hard surfaces. Maybe I'd wipe down the remote, you know, wipe down the handles of the doors, but not super high risk. So again, not gonna fly unless somebody really makes me do it. And if they are, I'm gonna be very careful about it. And I'd much rather take an RV across the country, but they're expensive, I looked into it. Okay, guy, take it away. <laughs> I think y'all need to be a lot less concerned about airplanes and a lot more concerned about restaurants. That would be my take home. Um, uh, yeah, planes, planes are interesting, right? Uh, at first, there were some incredible super spreader effects on planes, events on planes. Recently, there haven't really been a whole lot of major spreading events on planes that we're aware of. Um, I'm not sure how well that's being studied or reported. Um, but I think the, the reality is people are being careful before getting on planes and planes are very empty right now. Mm -hmm. um, the, the going, th the, the, what science is there is saying, yeah, there's not, that there've been tremendous super spreader events on planes. So the potential is tremendous, but that recently there has not been a lot of spread on planes. And that probably the potential going forward is somewhere in between, that if we start filling up those middle aisles and getting a lot of people on planes during the holidays, then we'll probably will start seeing some transmission, but it won't be like when you had nobody wearing masks on a plane when we had these really big events. That said, most doctors my age and older, they're not getting on planes. I, I see a lot of younger doctors getting on planes. I'd say 30 year olds have very different views on things. And I, uh, I'm, just, I'm just, from what I'm seeing, um, it's so complicated. It's not just the plane, it's where are you going on the other end? Mm -hmm. How are you getting there? Are you taking a cab? Is someone picking you up? Are you changing planes? I have to hang out at an airport now. Um, if I had to get on a flight, I would sort of do, I think I'd do the same things you described, except I probably would wear an N95. Um, it's overkill. Um, I, I would not eat or drink that whole flight. I would try to avoid going to the bathroom. I'd be 
alcohol in my hands, but I think I'd probably be okay and the numbers would play it out. I just wouldn't choose it. I'm all for road trips, I'm a big fan, but I'm also, yeah, hotels, eh, you know, if you need to, RVs are expensive. I mean, I, you, you need to figure out safe ways to do this. You need to be really aware when you're going to use that gas station bathroom of try not to touch anything, don't touch your face, alcohol your hands, and you know, wear a mask, alcohol your hands right afterwards, you'll probably be okay. Um, I stopped at a highway rest stop and used the bathroom and walked in. There were two people without masks and I was like, and we're in this small space. And I was like, are you kidding me? Um, yeah, but restaurants, I think that's what we need to be focused on. Like being across, a few feet across from someone, chewing, we're all there chewing, creating viral respiratory droplets in a room full of people creating viral respiratory droplets and then drinking alcohol while we're eating because we're excited to be back in a restaurant. So now we're truly forgetting like any kind of, you know, now put people in a bar and triple that risk of now we're, yeah. So bars and restaurants would need to avoid planes in a pinch if you have to, sure. But I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be volunteering to fly anywhere right now. But I'm not judging people who need to fly. I get the question a lot about eating on patios uh, at restaurants right now and still I'm still getting it even though we're getting cooler weather up, up near me and uh, I wouldn't eat on patios either personally I think again that's a risk choice that you can make I think uh, we all just need to become better cooks stay at home learn to cook your favorite dish if you can and uh, wait until we are able to really safely eat at restaurants I don't think that being outside uh, fully reduces the risk of transmission we do know that particles will dissipate faster outside rather, rather than inside. Uh, however, again, if you are eating and you're right near somebody else, even if it's just six feet away and everybody's chewing, and then maybe you have a server who comes to pick up the person next to you's plate before you've gotten yours and they don't wash their hands properly and they bring you your plate or put down your silverware or they put their hand over your glass. You know, there's just a lot of things that are kind of gross in general, but if you look too closely at anything, you're gonna find those sorts of risk factors. Having worked enough foodborne outbreaks myself uh, in, a, in a different career path, I guess same career path, different job. Don't ever do restaurant inspections if you ever wanna eat in a restaurant again. I'll just say that. So can I clarify with you, Mayan, you were saying that you would not eat on a patio. I, are you saying specifically in a restaurant or would you go to somebody's home if they had a, a deck or a, a patio in their, in their yard? What do you think about that? Ooh, good question. So what I was talking about were restaurants or bars. Uh, outside social gatherings are a great way to stay connected to people. So I'll give you a couple of examples. We had a friend who actually is a hospital worker who came to visit us for a night a few weeks ago. And she ended up pitching a tent in our backyard and we hung out around our fire pit. We maintained our six feet distance. We wore masks and we hung out outside. Same thing as being on a patio, but no patio, grassy yard. And that was great. And this coming weekend, you know, Halloween is a personal favorite of mine, but I'm not going to plan to do some indoor pumpkin carving with friends the way that I might. Instead, we'll plan to do an outdoor pumpkin carving where we will have space across the patio from each other and we'll wear our masks and we'll have fun, but we'll keep that social distance while wearing masks to ensure um, to ensure our safety. So social social connection is so important right now and it's gonna be harder in the winter months, months as it gets darker and rainier and, and colder, people are going to need to be inside more. But there are high risks of transmission of illness when you're inside, it's higher than when you're outside. And so people need to really start having some important conversations with the people in their bubbles and their close friends and their family about risk. And I was chatting with someone recently and explaining that it's really about consent. When you say you're going to spend an evening hanging out with a friend outside or inside, it's important to have those conversations about what their risk choices have been. What are their movements? What things have they done? And in that sort of language of consent, they need to be honest with you and you need to be honest with them so that you can each make informed decisions. Uh, anything to add? 
Um, I think I am a little more uh, open to the idea of eating uh, in a restaurant patio, but I'm a bit persnickety about uh, what that restaurant is and do I if if it's a place I know that I I I have a little I have more personal trust with both by uh, seeing the patterns of how they do things, how they space the tables, do they have hand sanitizer in table? Do I see that the servers are really meticulous about the way they're approaching this uh, with cleaning their hands, with always wearing masks, with insisting you have your mask when they come and talk to you? Um, I kind of really respect restaurants that are pulling that off. That's hard to do. Um, it's funny, I used to be obsessed with restaurant life and I kind of don't care anymore. I, I'm not in a rush to go back to indoor restaurants and that blows my mind. Um, I've gone to a handful of times to outdoor dining situations. Um, and each time I chose places really carefully and I was, uh, each time I was quite impressed, but I, I think I chose really meticulously places that were doing a really good job. Um, I haven't gone to any outdoor bar situations. I've been invited and had people over to my patio outside. And once more, you can, that can be good or bad. That can, it's, it's, it starts to make you really realize, have I had a conversation with this person about what their risks are? I, I prefer hosting where I can control the whole situation, where I know I've washed my hands each time, where I know, you know, just if, if someone's serving you, if you're going to someone's house and you're not bringing your own food and drink, there's, then you're, this is back to the consent, you're just fully trusting them that they're taking care of things when they're gonna, washing their hands before they hand you, you know, just, or in the whole food preparation process, if they have any idea how to do relatively clean food preparation. Um, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm not 100% against it. It's, it's, it's back to the, the devils and the details here. Um, Indoor dining, I just don't get it. I don't think there's any way you can do this in a safe way, just not right now. Outdoor dining, it's, it's a calculated risk. So Maya, you mentioned Halloween coming up and, and obviously we have some other holidays that, that a lot of you know, Thanksgiving and, and a lot of winter holidays coming up soon. And, and I'm wondering, um, what advice do you have for people? I am specifically wondering about testing. Like if you knew that you wanted to go and spend time with your family member for Thanksgiving, let's say, um, would there be a, a protocol you could take? Like, okay, I'm going to have a test five days in advance, and then I'm going to do another one, and you're going to do one, and we're going to make sure that we're safe. And and is that, can is, does that work? Is there a... a sure steps that somebody could take to, to be more sure about that if they wanted to be indoors with another person that they, is not currently in their bubble? So setting a, a specific protocol is challenging and it very much depends on the individual's levels of, of, of risk for poor outcomes, I would say. So for example, if you have a family member who is uh, immunocompromised and you want to be able to spend Thanksgiving with them, you know, getting a negative test is, is only as helpful as that negative test is accurate. And it depends on when you get that negative test. And it depends on the type of test that you actually get. Uh, and it, it also depends on, you know, between the time when you got tested and the time you see the person, what were you doing? So I would say that the safest bet is to sort of collectively with people who intend to gather together, first of all, identify a small group and make sure that everyone is very clear on what the expectations are. And then I would say that everyone should plan to do a two week quarantine at home where they are only leaving for the essentials. They're leaving to get the groceries, pick up their turkey and their pumpkin in a can and then stay home the rest of that time and monitor for symptoms. If you wanna build in some sort of testing into that, you certainly could. Uh, accessibility of testing is is definitely higher than it was even the last time that we from the last time we did this this session this talk but even so it still is hard to get tested in some places and and people are still reporting trouble getting tests 
uh, covered sometimes by insurance, even if there is free testing in their area, um, or if there isn't free testing, they're having trouble getting it paid for. So sometimes a test isn't an option, but implementing a good quarantine period is, is going to help reduce that risk. That said, if you're particularly uh, at high risk of illness, if you have an um, immune disorder, it's it's up to you, but it, it may, may not be worth the risk to spend time with other people. For, for more unconventional holidays like Halloween, there is some really terrific guidance coming out about how to have some fun alternatives. Uh, so the Washington State Department of Health released a few weeks ago some detailed guidance online about other activities, how to do sort of a trick-or-treating style Easter egg hunt combo in your backyard, or how to do virtual costume parties and other activities that are alternatives that will be certainly different, but are going to be safer and lower risk. Um, so again, it's a conversation with the people who you are potentially gathering with. I would recommend instituting a quarantine for everyone for a certain amount of time to monitor for symptoms. And if testing is an option, you could certainly build that in. Nicely put. <laughs> Um, first of all, a huge shout out to my adult daughter, Ivy, who uh, I proudly raised as a Halloween lover and who said, no, we are doing Halloween. Um, and who has set up in our yard, she's gonna make it very clear that there's a separate entrance and exit. So there's a straight walkthrough and people don't even have to pass by each other. Clear mask rules, there will be bags of individual goodie bags laid out and will be handed to you. There will be no reaching into a candy jar, but there will be huge num amounts of decorations. And she's putting up signs a week early, letting the people in, in the uh, neighborhood know Halloween is on, but it's on with rules. And this is how we're gonna do it. We're making it really safe. This is our protocol. We, we're encouraging you to come. This is how you're gonna come and good for her. So, you know, we can save Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> I have one friend who set up a PVC pipe on his railing <laughs> so he can shoot the candy down to kids. We're not going to have trick-or-treaters this year because yeah. um, I have asthma and so we're going to be particularly careful. But I have a lot of neighbors who are choosing to do it differently. But I yeah. love that idea. But, and, and regarding the other stuff you said, yeah, I mean, if you want to truly be safe, it's less about testing and it really is more about quarantining well. and having the conversation, understanding who it is, keeping the group small, it gets exponentially worse as you add more people, keeping the group small, knowing who you are meeting with and understanding, is anybody in this group particularly elderly or immune compromised because it's a very different disease course for them. Um, mm -hmm. Testing alone doesn't do it. The White House is wonderful proof of this. They had incredible access to testing and I think they fell prey to exactly this, this concept of, I got a test, I'm fine. No, one test does not mean you're fine. Uh, you could have easily taken that test just before you were actually expressing virus, enough virus. Um, and the, also, what were you doing since that last test? Um, that said, a, short quarantine, a shorter quarantine course with two tests might be sufficient if you're going to see someone if you're stuck that way, you trust them, you trust your behavior, they trust you and they're not an immune compromised person. Um, when I travel, um, I just wanna say it's not, it's, I'll, I can give me as an example. Um, there's pr pragmatic ways to do this. After my last shift, I'll, I'll do a baseline test. I'll get a second test at five, five days afterwards and I'll, I'll be quite good at quarantining during that period. With two negative tests, knowing I've been generally good for the past two weeks and extremely good for the past five days, I feel safe enough for contact with one person. And then after 14 days, at that point, I feel safe enough for contact, say, with my parents after a true 14 day quarantine period. So I mean, there, there are measured ways to do this, you know, but, but if you're gonna go see someone elderly or immune compromised, with or without the test, it's really about the 14 days. Yeah, my um, husband, which for those of you who don't know, I just got married. And an outdoor wedding, 
um, and nobody got sick, so that's great. Um, <laughs> but uh, my husband is building a trebuchet so he can deliver candy to neighborhood kids. So he's very excited about this. He was working on it today. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Not, not for flaming pianos. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's not that big of a trebuchet, so it, it's it's only throwing candy bar sized things. Toy, right now. Toy, toy flaming pianos. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. sweets. I think is the the hashtag he's going with. So anyway, um, <laughs> sure. um, so back to COVID. Well, yeah. Um, I in our our last time that we did this uh, in part one, we talked a little bit about um exercise and and gyms and guy you were saying that that you enjoy going to the gym but you haven't been and and you didn't see that that you would be interested in doing that anytime soon we have a, a question from uh one of our our viewers asking about swimming um in an indoor 25 meter pool where only one person can swim in each lane high ceiling uh, ventilation but it's indoors the air's humid Oh. What any thoughts, either one of you, about uh, well, exercise in general in this situation in specific? Wow, exercise is so crucial. I mean, outdoor pool, one person per lane, pretty good. I mean, I, I don't know. I used to be a swimmer. And I, people are gross in the pool. I mean, they come out of the water and there's just snot and spittle just come flying when the way. I mean, have you seen the way? people who really train in a pool breathe, it's, you know, it's kind of intense. Um, I don't know, indoor pool, I, I get it. I'm, I'm very athletic and I take my exercise really seriously. And luckily I do things like paddle boarding and biking that are relatively solo and done outdoors at quite a distance, even from the person you do it with, if you do it with someone else. Um, it's hard for me to judge and say, hey, you're a swimmer. Um, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be psyched to be going in an indoor pool right now. I wouldn't be psyched to be in the lane next to somebody. Just from my personal prior experiences in pools, it's, I mean, people are spitting all over you when they side breathe next to you. I mean, literally, they really are. The, when people get competitive in the pool, they are not gentle in how they exhale. Um, <laughs> That's just a great line. <laughs> yeah, I mean, outdoor outdoor swimming. My goodness, absolutely. That's easy for me to say. I live in California. Um, well, the, the ocean is freezing, but there's potential for outdoor pool use. Um, I, I don't want to sound like a snob and say sorry, you can't do that. But I wouldn't be jumping at indoor pools. So my rock climbing gym just opened. I got an email today saying we're opening. Come on back. Um, they're opening in a very controlled way. Um, it is a huge cavernous space. It's practically outdoors in terms of the air. One of the problems in there is it's freezing in the winter because it just has such, it, it's a former uh, iron foundry. It has, it's a big warehouse that has huge winds blowing through it. And they're gonna allow only certain amounts of people in and alcohol your hands before. And that's probably safe-ish. I mean, that's cool. I, I mean, I, I've been very impressed with their protocols of how they're gonna go about this and I support them. Um, it's a real question for me of when I'm going to be ready to go in and climb, especially when I live in a place where I could potentially climb outside. Um, and, you know, we've seen some outbreaks recently associated with gyms, and these are outbreaks um, that are tied back to somebody who was following the rules. They yeah. were, this was, I'm thinking of one in particular, it was like over 40 cases tied to this one individual who went to the gym, followed all of the guidance perfectly. The gym was implementing everything the way they were supposed to. And yet there was this huge outbreak associated with that facility. So it just goes to show that we can really have good intention when it comes to safety. And sometimes it still doesn't work. Did that person have a mask? Like this was everyone masked at the gym? Oh, I'd have to reread the study. Yeah, because I worry about like, I noticed like in exercise classes, people don't wear masks. They just don't. Um, for me, it would be very easy to mask while rock climbing. It's a, it's a strength sport. It's not an aerobic sport at all. Um, um, whereas I think of like a small room with exercise machines or an aerobic exercise routine, that just sounds like a nightmare. That sounds like a, a droplet production factory. Yeah. And that would be the I, only reason. I, I think, I feel like this, 
there are situations where indoor gyms like this, big cavernous space, people individually rock climbing, maybe it kind of breaks the, the gym mold, but my general approach about the gym goes with what I said about session one. Of why do you want to suddenly go into a small room with a bunch of other people breathing hard? Like that sounds, <laughs> sounds worse than the restaurant situation, which is really tough because I think exercise is crucial for our physical and our mental health. We have a- Bye. Buy those cross-country skis and snowshoes, people. We we have a couple of people asking about hot tubs. Um, if you can be in a hot tub in sequence or with other people, if you're wearing masks, any thoughts? Uh, I don't want to talk about hot tubs. They're kind of gross, uh, especially <laughs> if you have your own hot tub. It's at your own house. Don't, don't ask <laughs> epidemiologists about anything uh, restaurants hot tubs are burning man because they might just go ah! don't ask us about the potato salad especially or bean sprouts but uh, so <laughs> i'm thinking of, of an outbreak in particular that had to do with hot tubs and it just so it depends on the pathogen right so some pathogens really like warm sticky humid air some are completely not bothered by chlorine. Others are bothered by chlorine. You know, a hot tub, is it outside hot tub? Are you sitting in the hot tub and your face isn't in the water so you're not slobbering in it, but it's outdoors and it's, you know, you're sitting and you're not swimming and then somebody else gets in a few hours later. Okay, that does, that's not so bad. You know, hot tubs are hot tubs. They're always gonna be a little bit, ooh, but that's not particularly a concern for me. If it's indoors and it's in the, you know, the health center at your gym, uh, you're asking to sit in a humid, hot room where you're surrounded by people who are kind of just like sweaty and gross and yeah, they're in the water. And you know, how many of you have gone swimming or gotten into a pool and put water in your mouth and spat it out? Just think of the Olympics. They do it every time. Every single person gets in the water. So am I particularly worried about the water being the point of transmission? No. Am I worried about people just being kind of gross? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, like I said, don't ask me or any epidemiologist about something if you want to continue loving it. So I, I'm a card carrying Californian. I have a hot tub. I have also, I also have a surfboard and at one point I had a convertible. So I, I've achieved the California trifecta. Um, and that was the first thing early, early, early on that we shut down to anyone outside of our house. We were like, sorry, all you people that have sweetly had regular use of our hot tub, you're out. Like, you don't get to use our hot tub anymore. Um, yeah, I mean, you could safely use an outdoor hot tub with someone you trust in your pod, you know, chlorine it before, stay on opposite sides. Um, you know, if, if it's a big enough tub, wear a mask, sure. But uh, otherwise, I mean, I certainly wouldn't be uh, sharing. I, so the question is, what was the person asking about sharing a, using a public hot tub facility, like an indoor one? The question was, was just about um, hot tubs in general uh, from, from one of the viewers. And then a couple of our um, minions own a hot tub and they wanted me to ask that question. So when we have one at home, so yeah. yeah. I mean, if it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. Would, I would, if, if you're asking, if friends are gonna come over and use your tub and then you use it, I mean, that sounds, that sounds okay. You, you know, you can throw in some extra chlorine or bromine, you know, in between, I think you're probably good. Do you want a tub with them? Depends on the size of the tub. It gets back to the sort of patio consent dynamics. What are they doing? How close are you gonna be to them? Are you gonna wear masks while you're in the tub together? Is it a, four person tub with four people in it or is an eight person tub with two people in it? You know, how far away can you get from them? Unfortunately, the theme of today is it's complicated. Um, I, I'm, I'm less, I'm not the epidemiologist. I don't think all hot tubs are evil. I think most hot tubs are potentially evil if you don't clean them well. Um, but I think COVID's all about how, how close do you wanna to be to someone outside and just don't be around people inside. You have to be around people inside, make it absolutely with a mask on and for short periods of time. 
So if the theme of the talk today is it's complicated, the theme of the life of an epidemiologist is it depends. And that will always be our answer to every question. So yeah, if you're cleaning your hot tub really well, or if you're at an outdoor patio that is particularly safe and you've really taken into consideration certain things, and if you are doing a road trip and choosing how to stop in specific places and being really thoughtful about your safety, Okay, right? It depends. That is truly the answer to most of the questions that epidemiologists ever get asked. Asked and, and it drives people crazy, but it's the reality is it really does depend. Yeah. If you're wearing a mask and you're getting in and out of a hot tub carefully, sure. If you're both drinking alcohol and you know, your touch you're like drinking and touching your mouth and putting your hand on the side, that's this nice moist surface, and then you're putting your hand on that same area. This sounds like a great way to transmit germs, you know? Um, there's some help to the fact that this water's chlorinated, but it's, it's messy. If you're being good, you're being good. So speaking of it, it being complicated, I'm going to finish up with a question originally asked by Elizabeth, and I'm going to add to it. Elizabeth asks, what numbers should we watch regarding dangerous levels in our community, infection, deaths, cases per yeah. thousand? Um, I'm also going to add on to that something we talked about at the last, at the part one of this of, of who should we trust? Hmm. I get, guy, your silence. Okay, I'll get started. No, no, I, no. I'll say one thing before we Go start. Ahead. If you treat everyone as if they might have the virus, you're gonna be fine. If you're just always cleaning your hands after touching anyone from your touch, if you're always wearing a mask, if you just always treat those interactions, then if it turns out that that person who came to your house to do some work or that person you had an interaction with calls you and says, hey, I just tested positive, you're probably going to be okay if you kept, if you kept up your guard in the first place. So just mm -hmm. don't trust anybody. Okay, you take it away on this question then. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was letting you go with it. I just was, that was my intro. You talked first. No, you got to go. <laughs> oh, sorry. Well, now I'm forgetting the rest of it. Oh, how do you, I think as a, the epidemiologist needs to answer, how do you tell if cases are rising in your community or what are the, what are the hallmarks of a surge and when do we need to be worried? Because I'm, I'm really curious what you have to say about that because that's your turf. Okay. So, I'm going to tie these both both of these parts into the answer together. The first piece is when looking for the most up to date data and the most reliable information, look to your local and state health departments. Or if you're in a large county like LA County, look at your large county health department. That is the best place to get information in almost real time that is going to be unfiltered through whatever political uh, powers might be at play. The state and local health departments are driving policy within your state. They're driving the guidance for what is happening. For states where we have mask wearing rules or where there are um, restrictions on restaurants or on gatherings or on, uh, on businesses, those are guided by decisions uh, at your state or local health department in most states. And some states are potentially gonna be driven a little bit more by politics, a little less than the data. Uh, a little less on the data, but the best place to start is with those agencies. Now, many agencies have really helpful dashboards through Tableau or other programs. And if you log on to the websites of those agencies, uh, you'll be able to kind of play around with the data. You'll be able to look at the epidemic curve, which I'll describe in just a moment. You can look at hospitalizations over time. You will look at the uh, death rates and changes over time. So what I like to teach to the folks that I'm, I'm training to do investigations, and many of them are uh, really fresh out of high school, if they're in the National Guard, or maybe they're retirees, maybe they have a history of customer service and that's their background. Um, <clears throat> what I like to teach them is about the epidemic curve. So this is a really nifty thing, and you, when you look at it, it'll look very familiar to you, but essentially it's just like a bar chart, right? So remember, back to school, X and Y axis. I don't know what direction you're looking at, so just imagine X and Y axis vertical is going to be the number of cases 
at a particular time. And across the bottom, you're going to see on your x-axis the time, right? So usually for most state health departments, they use time when people started feeling sick or time at il illness onset. And what you'll look at over time is that lovely curve that shows us the distribution of cases. When did people get sick? So when we start thinking about this idea of flatten the curve, we're saying, how do we squish that curve down? So one of the best ways to really understand what's happening in your community is to go to your health department website or look at some of the other health organizations in your area and look for that epi curve. Understand what the pattern is in the community. Most of our areas around the country now are seeing a second surge of cases, which was very predictable. Uh, and in fact, in Washington, we're kind of seeing a, a decrease from the second bump and kind of a third bump coming up after that. And we are expecting it. We know what's happening with flu season. I heard a colleague say fluvid recently, which really stressed me out, but we are entering fluvid season, y'all. So look at those epi curves to understand what's happening. You can look at it and see a rise in cases. It could be that some of that is due to testing, and it could be that some of that is actually more related to true disease spread. But your agencies at that local level are going to provide you a lot more detail and a lot more nuanced interpretation for the local level. And that's what matters most. So is there a particular number that I'm concerned about that was part of the question? Not necessarily, not a particular rate or a percentage. It is more about understanding the dynamics of spread within our community. Where is it spreading? Why is it spreading? Is it isolated to long-term care facilities? Is it spreading among school students who are then going to school and bringing it back home? Is it spreading a kind of uncontrolled wide community spread? Or is it smaller outbreaks within our population? And we can understand why we're seeing those outbreaks and what specifically happened to lead to those really uh, central transitional moments or, or transmission moments or super spreader events potentially. So understanding how and why it's spreading is more important to me than a single number. And also support your local health departments and answer the call if we call you to do investigations. Okay, Mayan, so can I ask you practical questions in response to that? Do we have time for that, Amanda? We are running a little bit long. So yeah, um, if, it, if it's a short question, yeah, go ahead. I guess, so if it's, if it's spiking in your community, then in terms, like if you see it arise, in turn change maybe your habits. Like if you were considering going to restaurants, this is the time not to. If you're considering letting your kids go back to in-person classes, maybe if, you're, if your community is seeing a surge, that's the time not to do that. If you're hearing of a surge in, uh, what was the place in Northern Idaho, Sun Valley, Idaho, not a time to go visit there, you know, if for your summer vacation. Um, that, I mean, that sounds like what you're saying, you know, like you can use this to, to change your, the way you're acting, I suppose. Absolutely, yeah. You're definitely going to wanna to understand what's happening in your community to make risk-based decisions for yourself and your family. Uh, you can also look at how your state is using particular metrics. So in Washington state, we have dials that our governor kind of sets to describe the status of our response. What is disease spread? What are, is our hospital capacity? And some other factors to really describe the situation across the state in specific counties. And then you'll see different staged response and reopening plans. So essentially you're doing what the rest of the state and that the, the state and county level are doing, but you're doing it for your family and for yourself. Do you think we'll have less flu cases this year because we're all gonna be wearing masks and staying inside? I don't know, but we are seeing flu vaccine uptake a bit better this year than in previous years. So fingers crossed, maybe. <laughs> maybe we'll follow Japan's model after all, like good vaccination and good public hygiene and they have lower flu rates. Yeah, let's hope so. Get your flu shot. Um, right. <laughs> so with that, I think we will say thank you to our two experts, uh, Dr. Guy Shohat and Dr. Mayan Simkis. Thank you so much for sitting with us and answering so many questions. And um, yeah, this has been wonderful. And um, thank you to all of you for sticking around and watching our show this evening. I'm gonna share just a few things to uh, finish up and 
let you know next week, next Thursday on the 29th, just in time for the election, we're going to be talking about the neuroscience of real life monsters, psychopaths, CEOs, and politicians with Dr. Octavio Choi, who is a forensic psychiatrist. He's given a similar talk a couple of times in the past, and it's been really fascinating. And this was an event that we did have, um, we were going to be charging a fee for it. And then we decided, you know what, we feel like this is something that a lot of people might want to see. And so we have changed it to a free event. So you do not have to pay to come to this event, but we encourage you to join us. I, let's see, I also want to mention, speaking of paying for tickets, uh, we need your help. Um, we want to keep our events free as much as possible and our podcast free as much as possible so that as many people can participate as, as they can, um, but we can't pay the bills. So we can't continue in 2021 like this without changing something. So we are looking for volunteers and or new board members to join us on our nonprofit board to talk about fundraising and sponsorships. If that person is you or you know somebody, um, we would love to talk to you about that. Um, also, if you have a company or you, your employer might be interested in sponsoring a single event or, or a series of events, um, Science on Tap events online, please get in touch with us. The number is, or the number, the email address is info at scienceontaporwa.org. And I'm going to leave, that will be on the next couple of slides too. Um, we have been getting some very generous support from folks on Patreon. I want to say a big thank you to the 112 Patreon supporters we currently have who are helping us in a, in a very big way, make sure that we can, can pay the bills that we do have as much as possible. Um, so thank you to all of you folks. And I want to say a special thank you to one of our Patreon supporters, Carol Stewart. So thank you. And then finally, if you are able to make a donation for this event, um, any amount would be lovely. Uh, you can go through our nonprofit partner, Make You Think, and there's the one-time donation link there. Or again, you can join us on Patreon. Um, we'd be grateful for that. And then again, at the end, there's the info at science on tap orwa.org email address if you'd like to get in touch with me about um, volunteering or fundraising. So thank you all so much for coming this evening. Um, we appreciate your attendance and your, I, I'm sorry we couldn't get to everybody's questions, um, but I hope that, that we covered enough that you gained some valuable information tonight. So again, thank you to our two speakers and have a lovely evening.